by talking a little bit about my, my background. I was born in London, Ontario in 1953. My father was a high school biology teacher and uh, teaching at Central High School in London, Ontario. And uh, funnily enough, one of his students was David Suzuki's sister, um, whose best friend was one of our babysitters. So it's a small world since uh, David is here at UBC. My mother was a journalist, and she, had, she was one of the early women journalists in Canada. She spent her whole career uh, working at the London Free Press, and later she was the editor of two farming newspapers in Ontario. And I think from my, my dad, I got a, a, a love of going out into the, the world. And he used to take us out to uh, visit ponds and look at tadpoles in the spring and collect mustard to make mustard, own mustard and things like that. So we got a, a sense of the great outdoors from him. And from my mother, I got a sense of being interested in the world and uh, people who reported on the world. Uh, my parents loved to travel. and. In 1964, um, my father had a sabbatical and they uprooted our entire family, myself and my three brothers and one sister, uh, plus a big station wagon loaded it onto a boat in Montreal and we, uh, we took it to England and we spent a year in England. And uh, because we, uh, my, we couldn't afford to be in, in London as it turns out, my father uh, and mother found a a place in Norfolk County in a small village that's near the coast. Uh, my dad had this notion that since it was only 25 miles to Norwich, where the University of East Anglia had just opened, that he could commute in there to take his refresher courses. And what he didn't know was that in those days, 25 miles in, in rural England is probably closer to about 100 miles in Canada. So these are very narrow roads. Uh, I remember my father's station wagon filled the road. And we lived in a 500-year-old house in a little village that still looks the same 50 years later. Uh, there was a, a lord who had a mansion up the hill. There was a, a crofter cottage across from us. There were farmers around us. My brothers and I took the 11 plus, which was still there. We all failed because we couldn't figure out pounds, shillings, and pences. And I ended up in a secondary modern school learning how to be a farmer and how to be a fisherman because in the English class system that's what one did. And it was my first anthropological experience, though I didn't know that word at the time. Um, I realized it later, but I was just fascinated by the area, by the rich history and by the ability of my brother and I just to get on a bike and travel a few miles and discover Norman ruins, ancient castles, um, churches and things of that sort, and including the Second World War airfields that were all over the place there. So this was 20 years after the end of the Second World War, which seemed like ages to us kids, but now doesn't. And it was also a time of Beatlemania in England, and so it was a, a pretty wonderful time to be there. Um, the house we lived in had no central heating. We worked with the fire. It was like camping and things like that. And my British schoolmates um, all thought that Canada was a land of snow and mounties and that's all they knew about us. So also it was an interesting experience of being other, othered for the first time in my life as well with people who had very little knowledge of where we came from. So while I was there I developed an interest in archaeology of all things, primarily Romans, and the reason for this initially was the Romans built the only straight roads in Britain. And it could really please my father. We went on tra road trips by finding the straight roads in this big, big car, which he really appreciated. And that grew into a fascination. When I came back to Canada, uh, there was this notion in Ontario at that time that British schools were superior to Canadian schools, which was not true. And so uh, I was put into an advanced learning class and my grades went up from bare passes to A's and I started developing a uh, my interest in history at that point, I think in part being rewarded for that. Uh, and that continued through, through high school. Um, so when I went to university after finishing grade 13, my, my aim was to be an archeologist and I was gonna work in uh, Roman Britain originally. And uh, I started taking classes uh, first year in, at, in Western Ontario, and then later I, I went, spent one year at the University of Toronto. Uh, 
And uh, kind of to my surprise, I found out that uh, I, I wasn't doing well in classics, even though I'd taken four years of Latin. My ability to master Latin wasn't good enough, and so I was being discouraged from going in that direction. And uh, initially, although my attitude has changed, I, I considered North American archaeology astoundingly boring. At, the, at that time, they were, it was before Benford, they were only interested in arrowheads. And I went to one archaeology conference in Toronto where people argued passionately, fists were almost flying over the sequence of arrowheads, and I, I just couldn't quite see it. But by going into archaeology, I first encountered anthropology. I didn't know anthropology existed and was fascinated by uh, these studies being done in other countries. And uh, so my teachers at Toronto, Richard Lee, um, was, a one, one, was and is a wonderful teacher. And then I came back to London for my last two years and worked with a number of, of wonderful teachers there as well. Um, that got me interested in it. The other thing, too, that was very fortunate, and I think very few undergraduates get this experience anymore, was that I went into a program in Western Ontario that had just started. So I didn't know this. The first year I was there, I was in the very first anthropology course. And I took a year off, went to Toronto, and came back. So I was, at that point, in the second or third cohort going through anthropology at Western. And they had this arrangement where um, all of the undergraduates got together with the faculty once a week and read the works of one person who was then invited to come and spend two weeks at Western and be interrogated uh, by the students and the faculty. So uh, we all gained enormous big heads because we thought we were brilliant, but the first year it was Gregory Bateson who came. <laughs> and uh, Gregory Bateson told us that he had never been in a place where people had actually read all of his work. And he was quite impressed, and we were very impressed with him. And another year, it was uh, Skip Rapoport, um, of course, who, like Gregory Bateson, had worked in Papua New Guinea, where I eventually would go. Um, another time was Victor Turner, and so forth. And so this, this, these were just remarkable experiences for undergraduates. Um, so when I finished at Western, I, I had applied for a number of Commonwealth scholarships, and I got invited to go to either Australia or New Zealand. Um, at that point, I didn't know whether I wanted to be an academic, but I loved the idea of travel. So um, uh, the Australian universities, also in Auckland and New Zealand, would only take me into a PhD, and I didn't feel I was ready for that. Um, but I wanted to work a bit in the South Pacific and experience it. So um, the only place that would allow me to do a master's degree would have been, was Wellington, University of Wellington. And there was an anthropologist there who I'd heard good things about who I really wanted to work with, Jan Power. Um, at that point, I was very interested in structuralism and semiotics. And um, I had worked out this marvelous project, I thought which was to take a look at how Pacific Islanders were represented in, in magazines around the Pacific and how this interacted with their sense of themselves. Uh, and so that I, I, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and, and Power was well known for his work in semiotics. So anyways, I got the Commonwealth and it was great and flew off to New Zealand and found out that that Power actually had retired and uh, and Chowning was now the head, which actually turned out to be a lucky break because uh, Anne, who recently passed away, was at probably the, the most experienced ethnographer who's ever worked in Papua New Guinea, had worked in four different societies in different parts of the island, uh, knew the literature backwards and forwards, had very little use for structuralism and semiotics, but she was very tolerant and happy to have a student. So. Uh, so I ended up in Wellington, and this was in, in 1979, and this was my, in many ways, my, my third major anthropological experience. I left out one. I, I, in in uh, the mid-'70s, I was on a World University Service exchange that went to Guyana in South America. And to talk about that would probably use up all of your tapes, so I won't. That was quite the adventure. Um, but going to New Zealand was, was interesting in many ways because in those days it was still, even though you know, jet flights had been going on for a while, it was still very isolated. Uh, 
and um, very inexpensive to stay. So I, I had a grant of $3,300 for the entire year. I saved $1,000 <laughs> during that year. I lived in a house with 10 other people, a little farmhouse in Wellington. Um, in New Zealand in those days, on Saturday the afternoon, everything closed down. People worked on their gardens. Uh, nothing was open. It was just silent in the capital city of Wellington. Um, so this was all a very different kind of experience. And um, New Zealanders were very proud in those days because they, they read more than any other group in, in the world. They, they're isolated in one sense, in another sense they, they weren't. So it was, uh, it, it really was quite an amazing experience to be there um, and live there and have this experience. But my, my, uh, my project was totally undoable. This is long before anyone had dreamt of the internet. There was no way of going to the islands and asking people about their response to these magazines, which they probably didn't read anyways. And it, 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 it simply didn't make sense. And so I, when I got there, I, I, I initially went to the wonderful Arthur Turnbull, Turnbull Library, which is the great research library of the South Pacific in Wellington. And those days it was in an old Victorian house. And I would go down there and go through these magazines and get frustrated and bored, um, look for some other things to do. And they had this wonderful collection of old, old books on the Pacific. And most of these old, old books were written by missionaries. So I started reading these books, and they were kind of like adventure books I'd read as a kid, uh, like King Solomon's Mines and, you know, Boy's Adventures, things that I'd been reading actually in England, in the rural area, you know, and in the, in the, the books had been left in this old house we lived in. And so uh, I, I just got fascinated. This was not what I was expecting. Um, that these were actually kind of interesting, that these were explorers who were uh, like David Livingstone going into new areas, encountering people who had not encountered white people before, uh, trying to make sense of it. Um, there wasn't a heavy overdose of, of Christian kind of dogma and theology in these books, which kind of surprised me as well, although they were intended for mission audiences to raise money. So anyways, I got fascinated by those, and initially I decided I would do a semiotic analysis of this rich literature primarily from Papua, from the south, southern part of, of Papua, what's now Papua New Guinea, which was the British and Australian territory. And um, so I was in the Arthur Turnbull Library every day doing detailed notes, pretty much rewriting, <laughs> reinscribing many of these books because they wanted to do this detailed symbolic analysis. And um, I would show this to, to my supervisor, Ann Chowning, who would look blankly at it and just keep on saying, well, why don't you talk about the people? <laughs> Something interesting. And nobody there was interested in what I was doing um, in, in those terms, except for, for Anne, who was interested in the content. And, and she had read many of these works, which is very unusual for an anthropologist in those days. So she was actually aware of the history. So uh, I, I had a crisis and almost quit. And uh, uh, a, a, a wonderful, really, unheralded uh, New Zealand anthropologist, Bernie Kernow, who I still bless to this day, uh, sat down with me and went through my notes with me and said, you know, you've got a really, a really interesting historical piece here on, on the missions and how they interacted with local people from contact over the, this period that you've, you've uh, documented so thoroughly. So that's what I ended up doing. And in the course of that, I, I, I remembered something I'd forgotten. That was uh, in high school, my favorite subject was history. I never took a history course at university, but I loved history. And I began to realize that history and anthropology really do belong together. Uh, and uh, in those days tended to be neglected. I was also very surprised to learn, because I had this notion of, of Melanesia that came out of the anthropological literature of, of uh, you know, these exotic ceremonies and, you know, very bright costumes and things of that nature. And it came as a big surprise to learn, as they started looking at documents from the 1960s, that by the 1960s, the vast majority of Melanesians had converted to Christianity. So I then recognized at that time that the people who were uh, working on, on uh, doing anthropology in New Guinea were often working with memory culture. They weren't actually working on unconverted 
pristine people. And, you know, now this is a standard anthropological critique, but this was a real eye-opener uh, in the late 70s for me. Uh, and, and so it seemed to me that it would be really kind of interesting to actually look at this. And, and it's especially interesting to me because uh, in my historical research, the missionary literature was, was pretty uh, thorough and detailed up until the 1920s. And then by the 1930s, it almost disappears. And so I had all this rich, rich documentation on coastal Papua. And by this time, I expanded to look at, at two other missions as well. And I was curious to know what had happened since. And because anthropologists in, after the Second World War mostly went into the Highlands area, where the, the groups were more pristine, uh, there'd been very little anthropological research done on the coastal areas. And so I, at that point, came up with a PhD pro pro uh, project that I thought would be interesting to take a look at what had happened in those 30, 40 years when the literature stops. And I wanted to pick an area where uh, there had been no anthropological work done or very little uh, as well, in, in part because there's still the kind of romantic anthropological notion that you have to work with you know, some reasonably untouched group of people. Um, so I applied for a social science and humanities research grant. Uh, I knew about Ken Umberge's work on, uh, on millenarian movements on cargo cults. And at that point, uh, a book had just come out uh, called Mission, Church, and Sect in Oceania uh, that was put out by the Association for Social Anthropology in Oceania, which has done a long-term monograph series. And this was the first kind of collection that, that looked at Christianity, although it looked in, in Oceania, although it looked at it primarily from the viewpoint of missionaries. And uh, Ken Burridge had written the introduction for it, uh, a fantastic essay called Missionary Occasions, which provided a, a, a framework for thinking about what missionaries do and what their impact is, that looked at them as, as something different than the usual kind of you know, simple acculturative model that was being used up to that point, and also basically said, you know, what missionaries were doing in the interaction with indigenous people is actually interesting. It's not, it's not something that's, you know, it, there's awful aspects of it, and there's good aspects of it, but that's true of all life. And what's going on here is actually worthy of study and, and interesting to look at. So I wanted to work with him. And uh, so UBC was the only place I applied to go for my PhD. This time I decided I wanted to do it. And uh, I wanted to work with him. And I applied for the, the Shirk grant, PhD grant. And I, I was very lucky I got it. And uh, I came up here to start working with, with, uh, with Ken and arrived here at UBC in um, 1979. And I've had a connection with UBC ever since, which is, when I think of it now, is shocking. So I've been connected to UBC for more than half the life of the anthropology program here, which is absolutely amazing. Um, because when I came here, it had been operating for about 30 years, and I thought it was a very, very old program, which of course it was. Now I'm very, very old, so <laughs> we're all old. Um, so I came in to work with Ken, and um, who will also be part of this series, and I'll let Ken tell his own stories. Um, he, he is a remarkable scholar in many ways. He was also a very frustrating scholar to work with as a mentor. Um, Ken is extraordinarily good at telling stories. He's one of the best storytellers I've ever met, and uh, uh, his, I, I TA'd one of his courses, and his courses was him telling stories that, that linked into social organization. And, it's been a model that I've always wanted to follow and never quite been able to. Um, so so that, was, that was really wonderful. Uh, I don't think he ever quite understood when he was my supervisor that I wasn't studying missionaries. And I would always be correcting him that, no, I wanted to study Christians. I wanted to study Melanesian Christians. And I had decided I wanted to work in a place where people had been Christians for uh, at least two generations for you know, one of these areas I had studied on the coast. So, um, so that, was, that was kind of an interesting kind of, of situation to, to, to be in. Uh, 
Uh, it, it meant um, doing a lot of reading and research outside of anthropology, which I had already done, but now into history, into to theology, to think about these things. It also meant thinking about where a field site would be. And I had decided that I wanted to work primarily with a mission area, an area that had been missionized by a mission I found more or less palatable in terms of the interaction with the local people. And so even though I'd done most of my research on the London Missionary Society in the southern part of what's now Papua New Guinea, um, I, I decided I wanted to work with an area that had been an Anglican mission. In large part, this was because the Anglicans were a, a very ritualistic mission, very high church, a very hierarchical, um, but had a notion that uh, there was much to be admired in Papuan society, so they've been less interventionist than uh, the other two missions I had studied. Uh, there was a very good history that had been written about the mission in that area, so I had a bit of information on the communities through that area, and I knew there would be good archives, and I wanted to do archival research as well. So all of those things seemed to be coming together. So I was interested, and that gave me a region. So uh, the region runs from the eastern cape of, of Papua New Guinea up to what was the old British-German border uh, between Papua and New Guinea. So it was quite a large extent of ocean, actually about 500 kilometers, uh, very poorly documented. Um, nobody had really done much research on the coast in, in those areas. Um, so there have been short visits, uh, but, but nothing much detailed, and so it's hard to figure out where, where to go. Um, and it's at that point I met um, Antigen here, and uh, we, started, uh, we started dating and uh, eventually got married. And Anne is a psychologist, and she does work in developmental psychology, um, had done research in Sweden, so she already had a kind of cross-cultural interest. Um, thought that going to New Guinea would be amazing, which she's right. Um, and since she was faculty here at the time, she was also able to get nice grants. So she actually ended up with larger grants than I did. Um, but she needed a community with lots of children. And so we ended up choosing where we were going to go based on a kind of mixed need. I wanted a community that was second generation, I would prefer a community that had not had a mission head station, that is, did not have European missionaries, because most people don't know this, but most of the missionaries in Melanesia were Pacific Islanders. Uh, they were Polynesians and Melanesians. They weren't Europeans. So I was interested in a place where that had been the case. And, um, and we needed a place with, as I said, lots of kids. So it was very hard finding any information, but eventually I found uh, some statistical documentation on a couple of communities that had large populations. They were actually quite close to each other. One of them had an airstrip, and that's where the missions, head mission station was, but the other one, about 12 kilometers away, had not, and presumably had not had a European mission, though I didn't know that. Um, I was able to find, thrilled to find, word lists, for the languages of both of these places. So we had 100 words in the indigenous languages to work with. And then something pretty magical happened. The um, Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Papua New Guinea came through Vancouver and uh, gave a talk at one of the churches. And um, I, I still remember him. It was, a, it was a man called David Han, who had been in New Guinea since 1947. And he gave a, a very stirring, uh, dramatic sermon that reminded me of these old books that I had first read. And at the point where he talked about confronting the sorcerer, there was a thunderstorm going on, and a big lightning strike comes down right behind him, and the whole place brightens up. And I thought, wow, this is, he's, he's got it down. Um, so I met him, and I told him of my interest without actually naming any places. And he said, oh, you must go to Uyaku. And Uyaku was this place that was 12 kilometers from the, uh, the airstrip at Wanagela. And it turned out that was Wanagela had been his first mission post when he came to New Guinea. So he actually knew that area. And he had always admired the Mycene people who lived in the villages in the southern Collingwood Bay as being people who had found a nice balance between tradition and Christianity. 
and so he always enjoyed going back there, and um, he just thought they would be really interesting people to, to go to visit. So that pretty much settled it. And then we, we also wrote to a, a missionary nurse, an Australian who had been a Wanagala, who Bishop uh, Hand had told us about. And um, she, she also had been in New Guinea since 1947. She had been in Wanagala in the same place for all those years and never moved around. And so uh, Bishop David basically said she's going to be a font of information. So that was great. So we wrote to her. Um, she told us of who the local priest was in Uyaku. We wrote to him as well. Um, she, uh, I remember her writing back and saying there were lots of kids. So this was a re relief. And she said, at that point, Anne and I weren't married, but she said we must be married, otherwise it would be a scandal to the local Melanesians, which actually was not true, um, as we later learned out. Um, but um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about her later, but she became a very, very close friend and uh, supporter and just incredible knowledge of the local people and almost a saint in their, their eyes, and I think rightly so. The uh, local priest also wrote back to us and said, you know, we'd love to have you come, and uh, we were looking forward to it happening very, very soon. So uh, at that point, this was two years into my PhD at UBC, uh, at that point, Anne and I got married, uh, it, which, you know, not, we wanted to actually. It wasn't just to satisfy the, the Anglican Church. Uh, and uh, I boarded a flight uh, to head back to the South Pacific again, and uh, going ahead of Anne, and flew off to Australia, and spent a few weeks doing research archival work in Australia. And it's at that point um, that I began to learn a little bit more about the Mycenae. And I learned it, funnily enough, on a stopover in Auckland when I visited the High Commission for Papua New Guinea, or a Trobrian Islander was the High Commissioner, had a kula ornament up on his wall. And as I was waiting to see him, I was flipping through Paradise Magazine, which is the magazine for Air New Guinea. And in the centerfold was this beautiful, beautiful picture. Let me show you. It's not that it comes close to it. It's not as bright as that. Sorry, it's not as bright as that picture, but this is more or less the picture that was in the centerfold of that magazine. And the whole magazine article was on these people who make beautiful bark cloth, tapa cloth, where the women tattoo their faces and where the mountains rise from the ocean. And it was where I was going. I had no idea. And I went, wow. 